Good afternoon and welcome to Professor Lindy Yu, who is a fellow in economics at St. Edmund Hall, Oxford University, and an adjunct professor of economics at the London, at the London Business School. She is also a visiting professor at the London School of Economics and the chair of that university's Economic Diplomacy Commission. During her career, Linda has advised the UK Board of Trade, the World Bank, the European Commission and the World Economic Forum, among others. Her latest book, The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today, was considered one of the best business books of the year by both the London Times and Newsweek magazine. Her presentation today is based on that book. Before uh, Linda uh, gives us a presentation, just to remind you that the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen is the way to uh, give comments uh, or ask questions. It'd be good if you could also type in your name and affiliation with the question. Very helpful uh, for the chair in terms of reading out who's, who's asking questions. Um, the whole event today is on the record. That's both the presentation and the Q&A. So with that, uh, welcome again, Linda. Uh, very uh, many thanks for joining us today and we look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, how lovely um, to be uh, giving this uh, webinar with you. Um, of course, the my only regret is I can't be in Ireland. I always enjoy every visit that I have, um, but I look forward to a future one. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted um, to speak based on uh, my book, drawing on the ideas of the great economists. In a theme, which I'm going to go through, is about learning from history to try and rebuild um, the economic consensus. So I think the plan is um, I will um, go through uh, some of the lessons from history and learning um, from the great economists as we think about the economic consensus today, some of the backlash, some of the fractures, and indeed the challenges posed by COVID, which I really hope we can pick up um, in the Q&A in about 20-25 minutes time. Um, so um, B, I'm going to kick off with uh, the great economists. So what I've looked at in this book is how their lives, their ideas, and most importantly, how we can learn from them um, and hope not to repeat the mistakes of history and to recognize um, that perhaps Mark Twain was right. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So our challenges won't be exactly the same, but I think they're worthwhile lessons that we can pick up um, during these very challenging current times. So I'm going to start off with um, the ideas that have changed the world um, to see how the economic consensus has been rebuilt um, in the past when it's broken down before. And I'm gonna take you back um, as I do in the book about um, over two centuries, and we're going to go back to the mid 19th um, century or just under two centuries. The book itself actually covers 250 years of economic history. So the end of protectionism in the middle of the 19th century, and this is when the corn laws were repealed in 1846, marked a shift away from a more inward looking mercantilist mindset, which mercantilism is this belief that countries should run trade surpluses. Now, some of you are probably thinking that sounds really familiar today. Um, ideas come in waves. <laughs> but the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 um, meant that England started to turn outward and commercial relationships, globalization in the sense um, that's more familiar with us today, um, won the day over uh, mercantilism and protectionism because the corn laws were a very high tariff on imported grains that benefited um, English landowners. But that change didn't just come about because of, you know, um, it came about because great economists and others um, had uh, put forward um, the sense that the old consensus wasn't working. So David Ricardo, the father of international trade, was one of those whose ideas around comparative advantage, which is this model of how countries should specialize in exchange, um, changed the mind of the then, then prime minister, Sir Robert Peel, um, who then pushed for the repeal of the corn law. So that meant um, there was a new consensus around the benefits of globalization uh, that we would recognize today. But as with a lot of consensuses, uh, the consensus 
breaks down. So I'm going to lead you through the role that different great economists have played um, throughout the 20th century as that consensus broke down and then how it was rebuilt again. So just to give you a couple of um, milestones, I'm eventually going to end up with the um, emergence of the welfare state, which changed the capitalism of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that was how the battle of ideas over communism and, and socialism was won after World War II. And then I'll lead through to the fall of communism in the late 1980s, which seemed to, by the 1990s, give us a consensus, an economic consensus um, of the best economic system. But of course, today, that consensus is again broken down. And we are again at a point, especially with COVID, um, adding to the impetus to rethink the kinds of economic systems and policies that would suit us in the 21st century. So that consensus from the 1990s started to fracture indeed by the end of that decade with a backlash against globalization seen for instance in the protests against the World Trade Organization in Seattle um, at the end of that decade leading us into a 21st century um, world economy in which the backlash against globalization, high levels of income inequality so high in the United States that it's actually known as the second gilded age, um, as well as the inability to protect the environment adequately has all contributed to the sense that the economic system isn't working and it needs to be rebuilt and rethought. And it's that building of the consensus that I wanna try and cover today. So I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, just to say um, like this just helps situate the great economist that um, I write about in the book and whose ideas I'm going to draw from on a spectrum between those who believe the state should run the economy, Karl Marx, to those who were very much adherents to the free market. Um, and I have there Friedrich Hayek as um, a key example, as well as Milton Friedman, but it's a very rough, um, taxonomy, uh, but it just gives you a sense roughly of where uh, the classical economists, starting with, um, you can see there David Ricardo and of course Adam Smith, to the neoclassical economists, people like Alfred Marshall, who I will talk about. And then at the other end, you've got John Maynard Keynes, who introduced a role for the state in the economy. So we always have to start with Adam Smith. So the very first consensus that I described was on the back of work by great economists like him, that his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, laid the foundation for thinking about a market-based economy. Um, and that consensus around um, this uh, system um, lasted, as I say, and started to um, go undergo challenge, um, as I'll describe, um, really in the la latter part of the 19th century with the push to introduce a more welfare uh, component. Um, but Adam Smith is the father of economics. Um, his book, um, like all great economists, his book, uh, he took 10 years to write his book, but it was timed to influence the American War of Independence. So a lot of these grades were not just writing pieces of work, they intended to influence policy. And that's what he did uh, with the wealth of nations, um, and many of the others did as well. But the economic system that he um, wrote about lasted through the 18th century and a good part of the 19th century until we began to see some of the fractures. And the fractures that we really um, began to see um, really came about in the latter part of the 19th century, in the late Victorian period. So Great economists like Alfred Marshall, who's known as the father of neoclassical economics, taking the ideas of the classical economists and formalizing them. So he, Alfred Marshall um, was one of the greats at a time when after it seemed the repeal of the corn laws brought people into a new consensus around the importance of globalization. The downside of globalization was immediately, almost immediately seen in the panic of 1873. Um, that was an American railroad speculative bubble that burst and it spread a financial crisis across the Atlantic. 
and affected the rest of the world. It led to the Great Depression of the 19th century, also known as the Long Depression, which is when unemployment appeared in the dictionary for the first time. That was the rise of the trade union movement, and that was also the rise of Marxism. So Alfred Marshall, as a late Victorian, started to rethink some of the ideas around the economic consensus. There was a feeling that there should be help for the deserving poor, that was the phrase used at the time, and helping them through welfare did not disincentivize work. And that began to lay the foundations of introducing the welfare state, which um, was very much um, needed because of the global um, system that I described as shock. And it was also a period of very high income inequality uh, known as the Gilded Age um, in the United States. That meant there was even a greater impetus to try and change uh, the economic system. And it was through work um, such as by people like Alfred Marshall and the writings of others and many in society who are advocating for this change that you began to see a shift from Adam Smith's economic system into one that had a greater welfare component. Um, and it was helped by the writing of great economists like John Maynard Keynes. Um, his seminal work came in the 1930s on the general theory about ending the Great Depression. What it did was establish a role for the state in the economy. So the big revelation with Keynes, um, and it's captured in his famous saying, is in the long run, we're all dead. So he was arguing against the economic um, orthodoxy that the economy writes itself in the long run. So there's no need to intervene uh, to help the unemployed or to give welfare. And Keynes's point was of course in the long run, it's all a bit too late. Um, so that kind of led to this rethinking um, of the economic consensus. So I mentioned the early part of the 20th century um, was this period of, of rebuilding the consensus and was rebuilding at a time when there was a battle of ideas and it's captured in the title of the next great economist that I've um, put on screen, Joseph Schumpeter, his 1942 book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. Because in the early part of the 20th century, there were those who believed that introducing welfare wasn't enough, that you just had to reject the economic system. So at that time, about 40% of the world's population and then maybe another 20% or so of the people lived in either communist or partly socialist countries, regimes. So that led to a need for a debate between the great economists um, about how the economic system can be reformed and arguing that capitalism was synonymous with democracy, which is what Joseph Schumpeter argued um, against the socialist system. That became part of the post-war um, debate to rebuild a consensus, bring people together to agree to reform the system rather than say, um, follow the um, regimes of the Soviet Union at the time, or indeed, um, which was of course the first country that adopted um, Marxism. And what's interesting is Socialist Schumpeter, who's Austrian, who was from the Austrian School of Economics, his main body of work, um, what he's known for is creative destruction. And this is the theory that lots of firms compete and the winners survive and the losers, well, they, they disappear. <laughs> and this, this churn is what's the essential engine of capitalism. But again, like all the greats, he didn't just look at the technical work. What he did was he embraced the big debates and ideas of the day to try and shape the, um, the new economic consensus. And he wasn't alone. Um, Friedrich Hayek, um, another Austrian, um, he taught at uh, the Lenin School of Economics. Um, he also wrote on this issue and he is, Hayek is known for um, being a proponent of the free market. He was the um, ideology behind the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions of the 1980s. His book, The Road to Serfdom, um, was published in the post-war period, which likened 
the alternative systems, the communist systems, to a road to serfdom. Because in his argument, um, if the state controls what you do, where you work, um, what you consume, um, then that can't be anything but um, taking away one's freedom. So his ideas were hugely influential, including behind the Iron Curtain. And he just lived to see um, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, it seemed a consensus that appeared at that time, which was a reformed capitalist system with a welfare state was, um, and globalization and redistribution to reduce inequality seemed to be the new consensus over, as I say, the, the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the introduction of market-oriented reforms in China. So it seemed as if we were moving to this new consensus by the beginning of the 1990s. Um, but of course, as I described um, at the start, that consensus didn't seem to last very long because by the end of the 20th century going into the 21st century, we seem to be experiencing again, a lot of that discontent and um, which brings us roughly to today where we have quite a lot of need to again rebuild that consensus as to what kind of economic system can protect our environment, reduce inequality, be commercially open to global trade, but address the distributional impact um, and um, you know, reconsidering what the role of the state might be, which has been also triggered um, by COVID-19. And I think that's the point of history we're at in which the need for ideas and the battle of those ideas is hugely important. Um, before I go through um, some of these um, issues that we'll have to look at in order to rebuild the consensus, I just want to point out something which I'm sure is apparent to everyone, which is um, economists don't um, agree um, generally. So there's a great um, saying by the former US president, Harry S. Truman, who said, just give me a one-handed economist because every time he asked for um, an answer, um, he would hear um, on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, but it is actually this robust debate um, battle of ideas that's needed. And one of the rivalries that I'm gonna highlight between two of the great economists um, that I discuss will give a sense as to how you can, I think, um, have a robust exchange of ideas to really craft the policies that would work um, and to build a consensus around those policies. And it requires um, airing and debating um, different approaches. So one of the most famous rivalries um, in, um, among great economists is between John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich Hayek. So Keynes was a Cambridge economist, part of the Cambridge School. Hayek uh, was part of the Austrian School, but he was later brought to the LSE. So the debate was actually Cambridge versus LSE, Keynes versus Hayek. And the two of them agreed on uh, very little. <laughs> and, um, there are two uh, brilliant uh, rap battles like Hamilton, uh, where two rappers pretend to be Keynes and Hayek, and they actually rap out their different explanations of the Great Depression. And then they did the same for the Great Recession of a decade ago. That first video has, I think, over 7 million views. So it's kind of like Hamilton before The Economist. But despite their great rivalry, Keynes and Hayek were also um, personal friends. And when Keynes passed away, Friedrich Hayek um, wrote to Keynes's widow, um, the Russian ballerina Lydia, um, and said that Keynes was the greatest man he had ever known. So this battle of ideas is not ad hominem, it is purely that, that of ideas. So as we enter into our current period of looking at how we should rebuild our consensus, these are just some of the issues I'm gonna highlight for you to think about. And these are the chapters from the book, and I draw on um, the thinking of the great economists and how those models and evidence has changed since they wrote the first model um, in order to help us think about building a new consensus around some of these big challenges. 
The first one is should government rebalance the economy? Um, and this would be toward manufacturing. Second one is do trade deficits matter? Drawing on the ideas of David Ricardo. Can China become rich? It is a um, politically communist state. Um, is inequality inevitable? And this is an issue obviously, which is hugely um, um, on, on people's minds. And again, I'm drawing on the ideas of Alfred Marshall there. Are we at risk of repeating the 1930s um, to invest or not to invest? And this picks up on um, another idea of Keynes and the IMF recently has said it's rarely been a better time to have public investment in digital and green um, initiatives and infrastructure. So that's um, despite the highlighted dev levels. So that's another issue um, that I cover in the book. There's another page with a lot of economic challenges. Uh, what drives innovation? Um, uh, it was Robert Solow, the great economist who said, um, we can see the computer age all around us, except in the productivity data. So what drives innovation in the digital age? Um, and it will raise our productivity, which is um, one of the related questions. Um, can we learn from financial crises as we go through another um, period of crisis? Why are wages so low? And one of the most important questions, I think, um, for standards of living. Are central banks doing too much um, as we enter another period of potentially negative interest rates? Um, that chapter draws on the ideas of Milton Friedman. Why are so few countries prosperous? And this is a very long standing question. How is it um, in the 21st century that only a quarter of the world's countries are high income? Um, do we face a slow growth future um, because of slow productivity growth? And is globalization in trouble? Um, there's another backlash against globalization because of the distributional impact um, on society amongst others. So on this, um, the ideas that I draw upon are from Paul Samuelson and he proposed the best way to help the losers from globalization is essentially to judge all redistributive and pre-distributive policies using an ethical lens. So an ethical lens, this is a version of John Rawls's a theory of justice, the veil of ignorance, where if you don't know if you'll benefit from a policy when you support it or don't support it, then that allows you to take an ethical lens to judge whether you might, um, it's a good policy, if you don't know if you're a loser or a winner from globalization. And pre-distributive policies is the current debate about how we can make globalization work better. And this is around giving people the skills, the human capital, perhaps even the infrastructure in order to gain more equal returns in the labor market um, on top of redistributive policies, which is to help them um, with income support after they've been affected by globalization or automation. So this, um, so economists have known uh, this for quite a long time since the time of David Ricardo. So Paul Samuelson was asked, he was an advisor to US presidents, uh, why, if we've known this for all this time, policy uh, doesn't address um, distributional impact in globalization. His answer was, I can't think of a president who has been overburdened by knowledge of economics. So I'm just going to conclude with two more quotes about solving our economic problems. Uh, this is from Robert Solo, who says, um, don't omit qualifications, never claim more than you can justify. Um, and I think that's an important lesson to bear in mind, as well as um, the next one, which is from Joan Robinson, another great economist that I write about. And her advice is really why even if economics isn't your cup of tea, the best reason to know um, economics. She said, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. So um, in the book, um, I write about um, the evidence behind all of these uh, questions um, and essentially ignites an, a battle of ideas around what can be done um, and what should be done in hopes of rebuilding um, an economic consensus. But as you'll have seen from the timeline that I set out from the start, it can take a long time 
just to identify the issues. And certainly it takes time and a lot of input to rebuild the economic consensus into as to what kind of system works best to protect the environment, to protect people by reducing inequality and to address the backlash against globalization. All of these issues are intertwined um, and we're only going to be able to rebuild an economic consensus if we have this debate. And I hope um, my gallop through the lessons of economic history um, and some of the ideas of the great economists might help us um, as we go through this um, currently um, in the 21st century. So thank you very much. Thank you.